Well, I want to formally welcome you to this class on Christian warfare as it pertains to health and the kingdom of God. So if you have a Bible, I want you to follow along and turn to 2 Chronicles 16. And we're specifically going to look at verse 12. And uh, I'll flash that up here on the screen. These are the words of God. And Asa became diseased in his feet in the 39th year of his reign. His disease was severe, yet even in his disease he did not seek Yahweh, but the physicians. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time where we can look at your word and we can consider the topic of Christian warfare. Help us to be diligent to understand uh, your word, understand this world, God, and help us to take godly dominion over our own selves. And uh, Father, we pray that you would give us health and grant us this health so that we can serve you and your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, it is great to be with you all. I'm honored to be able to record this lecture for the students of Cruciform Bible Institute. My name is Jason Garwood, and I have the privilege and honor of serving the fine people of Northern Virginia at Cross and Crown Church as a teaching pastor where we teach and proclaim and build on the premise that Jesus is truly Lord of the world, and because of that, he gets to tell Caesar what to do. Christ has purchased the world with his blood, which means no further blood is required. His will do. Christian warfare, as we'll see, begins here with the authority of Jesus Christ. Now, because of this conviction, we believe at Crossing Crown that our purpose lies in the equipping of men, women, and children to press the crown rights of King Jesus into every area of life. And since health is one of those areas, it's one such area, the crown rights of Jesus must go there. It was Cornelius Van Til in his book, The Defense of the Faith, who, in agreeing with Abraham Kuyper, stated, quote, Unless we press the crown rights of our king in every realm, we shall not long retain them in any realm, end quote. Now, Van Til was absolutely correct. The default assumption of the gospel is the furtherance of the healing of Christ. It is the healing of Christ which makes up the gospel message, starting with the human heart and working itself out from there. So by definition, the gospel brings healing. That's what the good news of Jesus Christ brings to the world. When I wrote the book, Health for All of Life, I did not realize how critical and timely the issue would be. Uh, I began my research in the fall of 2019, but didn't really dig into writing the book until late winter or early spring of 2020, just weeks before the lockdown madness began. During the early months of 2020, I, like you and many of you, watched as the world began to descend into madness and hysteria. Sure, figuring out why people were getting sick was on the forefront of everyone's mind, and I do not find it disagreeable to find a solution to help people, obviously. The big problem I had early on was the narrow-minded approach to said solutions. Throwing people on a ventilator last second and giving them remdesivir, which shuts down the kidneys. There's a reason the doctors jokingly call it run, death is near. All of that wasn't really a good plan, especially when big tech is actively censoring other legitimate therapies and drugs. Nevertheless, at the beginning, all of us wanted to take a minute to discern just what was going on. However, as time quickly progressed, the charade became more and more obvious. Obfuscation from medical leaders like Anthony Fauci and even the Surgeon General frustrated us because we were told one thing on one day and a completely different and opposite thing the next day. Furthermore, books like The Price of Panic hit the shelves in the fall of 2020, exposing this, quote, Great Reset, dubbed as such, by the way, by Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum. The data was streaming in, but it was hard to sift through, the reason being because the CDC kept moving the goalposts, something we have confirmed now two years later. Now, I say, I say all of this now because oftentimes in Christian warfare, we don't get to choose our enemies. We don't often get to choose our enemies. COVID-19 and the truckload of problems that came with it appeared to us really without much warning. Sometimes those enemies just show up on our front porch and we have to deal with them. 
What most people do not recognize, however, is that the enemy that we call Big Pharma, backed by the federal government, which shields it from liability, has been and continues to be an enemy to the people of this country. So it's not as though COVID-19 and the ensuing government debacles brought us medical tyranny. Rather, COVID-19 and its debacle shined a light on an already problematic issue of state-controlled medicine. So we have for a hundred years watched this beast rise up out of the sea. That's what we've witnessed. Ever since the Flexner Report of 1910, the federal government has had its grubby hands in our health and it has not gotten any better. In fact, it has gotten inexorably worse. At least that's my argument. <laughs> so yes, I have a major problem with synthetic drugs that may treat one particular symptom but end up causing several other symptoms. I have a major problem with forcing injections into people's bodies. Perhaps my biggest issue, aside from a general distaste for how modern medical practices are done, is the enormous and fallacious justifications that are put forth for giving up your God-given right to self-government in this area and instead doing whatever you are told by the elites at the top. We are undoubtedly at war in this arena because we are at war with idolatry. Any, pick any issue, whether it's abortion, holocaust, you name it. We are in a war in those areas because we are in a war with idolatry. The idol of statism, which has just revitalized Molech worship or Baalism, the idol of sta statism has been propped up because of decades of Christian retreat. I want to say that again. The idol of statism, the biggest thing we have to fight right now, has been propped up because of decades of Christian retreat. We gave up the arena of health to the state, just like we've given up so many other areas. And now we are reaping those rewards or consequences. Now, it's hard to be healthy today. Honestly, it's hard because of our food supply. Uh, the soil from whence it comes, it's all being depleted of nutrients due to mega farming practices and so on, overburdensome regulations and whatnot. Uh, GMOs, pesticides and herbicides, geoengineering in the sky in order to control the weather, fluoride in the water supply and so on. Are, all of those things are contributors to this difficulty of why it's difficult to be healthy. Obviously, we live in a post-microwave fast food generation and we are suffering because of it. The recipe for disaster, I think, is really, really simple and basic. Bad foods plus no self-governance equals bad health. Other things, of course, contribute to that. But there's one more formula. Bad health equals non-engagement in the Christian mission. The health for all of life mantra, our team loves to say this, when you're sick, you're out of the fight. When you're sick, you're out of the fight. Taking control of your health in the realm of Christian warfare is obviously something that goes hand in hand. Because if you're sick, if you have chronic issues and you're not getting to the root of those things, you're not exercising self-government in those areas, you're out of the fight. You're not even in Christian warfare. You are sidelined because of it. Now, Christian warfare is, to steal and borrow from John Frame, a multi-perspectival affair. On the one hand, we have the internal struggle for holiness and sanctification and righteousness in our own hearts, and our own bodies, and our own minds. Um, anything short of an all-out assault on the old man and the old heart tempted by sin is a failure to participate in Christian mission. So anything short of an all-out all assault on those sins, on the old man, is a failure to participate in Christian warfare. So we know the battle against sin and unrighteousness, it always starts in the hearts of men. From a different perspective, we also have an external struggle for holiness and sanctification in the created order itself, including in other people. When Adam and Eve sinned, covenantal death became the reality that all men without exception experience. Covenantal estrangement, we might say, now defined man's relationship with four things. One, himself. Two, his neighbor. Three, his environment, or what we call the creation, the created order. And four, his God. Covenantal estrangement defined 
man's relationship in those four areas, himself, his neighbor, his environment, and his God. Thus, Christian warfare, Christian being in the adjectival form, assumes that the gospel has definitively and authoritatively abolished the covenantal estrangement and all the covenantal estrangement. This is the healing that I referenced a little bit ago. The gospel itself puts the covenantal death to death, which, as a consequence, reunites man to himself, to his neighbor, to the creation, and, of course, to his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christian warfare is set within this context, and the topic of health, as we'll explore shortly, relates to all four of those categories. Now, let's consider this passage from 2 Corinthians Excuse me, 2 Chronicles chapter 16. We're going to get to Corinthians in a second. 2 Chronicles 16, verse 12. The LSB reads, And Asa became diseased in his feet in the 39th year of his reign. His disease was severe, yet even in his disease he did not seek Yahweh, but the physicians. Asa's foot disease may have been gangrene or even gout. The context beforehand in verses 7 through 10 tells us that this dis-ease was divine judgment against him. Now, this doesn't mean that every sickness is divine judgment per se, but in this context, it's pretty clear. The text tells us that this occurred during the 39th year of his administration. 1 Kings 15, 23 through 24 doesn't tell us much else about this other than the diseased feet issue, but remember that Chronicles was written post-exile, so it takes a different approach in explaining why the exile happened and where the breakdowns were. The criticism here is basic to our understanding of health. The text says that even in his disease, he did not seek Yahweh, but the physicians. As Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Asa's main problem was his obstinate inability to recognize Yahweh as the source of all healing. I'll say it again. Asa's main problem, as the text indicates here, is his was his obstinate inability, his recalcitrant heart, his inability to recognize Yahweh as the true source of all healing. Exodus 15, 26 reads, And he, that is Yahweh, said, If you will earnestly listen to the voice of Yahweh your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians, for I, Yahweh, am your healer. Psalm 103, verse 3 tells us that God is the one who, quote, pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, end quote. Asa's heart, his recalcitrant, stubborn heart, led him to a place where he only sought help from physicians and not from God. Rather than follow David's lead in the book of Psalms, who cried out to God with oftentimes immense tears and prayers for deliverance, Asa ignored God, seeking only help from the physicians and possibly mediums and occultists. All prior faithfulness was forsaken here. All prior faithfulness was forsaken here. Hezekiah had a similar fate, except he was healed, but 2 Chronicles 32.25 says that he didn't respond positively to God's kindness, and thus the wrath of God came upon Judah and Jerusalem. The Hebrew word here translated as seek is a solid translation. It emphasizes this active inquiry into finding a resolution. Uh, The things we resort to oftentimes tells us where our confidence lies. Asa was a depressed man, probably because he felt as though the Lord had left him. And in his discouragement, Asa's lapse uh, earlier in the text set the tone for the rest of his life. He didn't finish well. He didn't make godly Christian warfare in this regard. Instead, he resorted to the physicians to fix him, and only the physicians. It wasn't that he went to them, it's that he only went to them. In his prior political conflict, he sought to bypass God and lead the people out of his own and by his own volition. In in this particular health conflict, he did the very same thing. He took matters into his own hands. Now, that's not to say self-government runs up against this principle, but self-government, as we know, is only self-government as it pertains to God, and it is, in fact, a fruit of the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, the rest of the text says that Asa was buried among the kings, and <clears throat> the Bible says much about that, but he was a good guy. Asa was a good guy who simply didn't finish well. Oftentimes we remember the earlier years, but when you don't finish well, those years can be sullied by bad choices. Now, a quick word about 1 Corinthians 11. You, you can turn there if you like. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 29 to 31. The church in Corinth experienced weakness, sickness, and death, and in that order, according to Paul. And that was because of failing to judge the body rightly. Weakness, sickness, and death. That is, their attitude toward the body of Christ, the people of God around them, which is tied to the communion table, no doubt, had led them to a place where they incurred the wrath of God. They incurred God's judgment. So like Asa, they did not seek the Lord regarding the, the circumstances surrounding their physical problems. We, we should be seeking the Lord first and immediately before anything else. Now, this means that there is a connection between physical ailment and spiritual degeneration. This does not mean that each and every single time that someone is sick, it's because of some unconfessed sin. Obviously, the Bible doesn't teach that. It could be the case that there is a relation, but it isn't always the case. The Lord loves us like sons, which means he will discipline us accordingly. But there's more going on than just a sick person who has sinned up a storm. I want to shift gears for a minute and get into some philosophy because I think it'll help us. Uh, it will seem like we're taking this abnormal detour, but I promise we'll come back around and it will make sense to you. When we speak of Christian warfare, we are doing so in both the spiritual and the material realm. We are dealing with covenantal estrangement on a grand scale. As I said before, all of life fell into the ditch of covenantal apostasy, and so the gospel brings it all back onto the road. Health is one of those things. Now, I'm not convinced that had Adam and Eve chosen not to eat of the forbidden tree that they would have lived forever anyway. Perhaps if they had eaten from the tree of life. I think clearly the death that Adam died that day, the Bible says, was covenantal. It was a spiritual death. Uh, but either way, the result was devastation and ruin for all of mankind. Part of the devastation and ruin, what we Reformed folks call total depravity, is the problem of man's relationship to creation. So sin, at the very least, exacerbated the conditions of entropy for man. The spiritual barrier that, not, that man has the man now has between he and God, which we know is only rectified by God's grace and his provisional atonement, that also incurred thorns and thistles. That's a breakdown of the created order, what we call entropy. So this problem of man's relationship to the world is what reformational philosophy seeks to answer. It was Hermann Duiverd, along with his brother-in-law, Dirk Wallenhoven, who developed this reformational philosophy, which is oftentimes called the Amsterdam philosophy. Duiverd's philosophy is fairly difficult to navigate, but I'm going to break it down very quickly. First, Duiverd believed that theoretical thought itself needed a critique. So many people had been dealing with theoretical thought throughout the years. Far too much of the world was driven by Greek metaphysics, obviously developed uh, in large part by Plato and further by Aristotle. Another segment of the world, Christianity, was driven by the ground motive of nature versus grace, thanks to Thomistic and scholastic categories. Duiverd believed that all of these ground motives, all of them, while important to think through, were ultimately putting forth unbiblical systems of thought. What should drive the Christian, as he considers philosophy, and even theology in terms of it being a science, is the narrative of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration as well. That's what should drive our theoretical thought. So history is going somewhere, and we're not just stuck in the gears of some uh, terrible karmic existence. Dewey developed 15 modal aspects of creation. So they're called modal aspects, but it's just experiences, these things that are in creation that we experience and deal with these modal aspects, these modes. And I'm going to tell you what those are and explain a little bit why this is a connection to Christian warfare. Those 15 modal aspects are the um, arithmetic, the, 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 the mathematical or numerical. We have the spatial, the kinematical, or what we call the energetic, 
There's the physical aspect, the biotic aspect to life, the sensorial, uh, psychical aspect to life, the logical, the historical, the linguistic modality. Uh, we also have the social aspect of life, the economical, the aesthetic aspect, uh, the judicial or juridical mode, and uh, kind of what comes after that is the ethical mode of, of uh, creation in this world. And then finally, we have the pistical aspect, which is just a reference to faith and theology. So each of these categories or aspects or creational experiences ebbs and flows with each other. However, they cannot be collapsed on each other, and nor should we reduce all of creation down to one particular aspect. And neither can we maximize one so as to subsume and encapsulate the others. And we also cannot and should not detach those things from the law structures, Dewey Verd's language, that God has put into place. His law, we know, encompasses all of reality and speaks to all of reality. So certain aspects of creation can only do what they do because of, of law. There's laws with regard to mathematics. There's laws in terms of space. There's laws in terms of energy and energetic uh, aspect of life. All of these laws are there. They're law structures that God has put there. So I'll give some examples. First, any ism that seeks to absolutize one aspect does so when it rejects God's law and the subsequent law structure involved in that aspect. So for example, uh, Karl Marx, he took the economic aspect of creation, that which belongs in the uh, what we call humanities category or the spirative category. He absolutized that um, in its humanity and spirited because it pertains to man and his mind. But he absolutized the economic and thus he created communism. The historical process of dialectical materialism resulted in the absolutizing of the economic experience of man. So everything is viewed through that lens and of course disaster followed. Another example, Darwin reduced all of life down to biological processes and thus in his reductionism he absolutized the biotic aspect and the historical saying that all of life, speaking of origins, all of life stem from biological processes over time. When one is maximized, the rest are conflated and aberrant teachings and pagan systematic accountings for life are promulgated out into the world. And those are the unbelieving thoughts of man, unregenerate man. Second, the history of philosophy is plagued with men who try and envision a universe without God. The core of Van Til's, ap Van Til's apologetic was shaped by the presupposition that, quote, Christianity is the sine qua non of the intelligibility of anything, end quote. That is, once the creator and creation distinction is destroyed, you cannot make sense of anything in the world. Nothing is intelligible. So you end up with the aforementioned errors in thinking and predication and worse yet, application. That is communism being an example. Rushduni writes, Christian thought has consistently gone astray throughout most of its history by seeking to answer the world in terms of the world's own categories, end quote. Now, Rushduni is correct. But we must not make a mistake in our interpretation of what he's saying. He's not saying that all of these aspects, minus the pistical faith aspect, belong to the world in terms of categorization. It's not as though Christianity only has the faith aspect of life, but physics, mathematics, biology, and the others belong to the world. No, all of it is only understood, intelligible, Van Til says, in Christian terms. All of it is only understood in Christian terms. So the mathematics can only be accounted for in Christian terms. The economic aspect of life can only be accounted for in Christian terms. The biotic aspect of life, we're talking about health, can only be explained in Christian terms. So to divorce these categories from Christianity is to make the Thomistic mistake, marrying the doctrine of grace to the Greek concept of nature. And worse yet, we make rationalism and the so-called authority of man's reason the thing that encompasses every one of those aspects. Thus, God is, as Rushduni said, swallowed up by nature. Now, Vollenhoven made a brilliant connection between the structure and direction of law. 
the structure and the direction of law. Law tells us what is. Norms tell us what ought to be. Vollenhoven said that these creational aspects or modalities have a certain law structure to them. They are simply immutable laws that govern each of those sciences. So the structure is put there by God. It just is what it is. You, we, we, we try to figure out God's creation and you just can't get away from these law structures, no matter how many times scientists try. But there's also direction to those laws. Direction means that those things either go towards God in faithfulness or away from God in disobedience. One of the main things about the Amsterdam philosophy that I love is its emphasis on the human heart. The direction of the heart is our main concern. We either have regenerate hearts directed towards God, and thus we experience and develop these structures in the created order in a proper manner, or we have unregenerate hearts directed towards man, and thus we experience and develop these structures in the created order in an improper manner. Now this brings us back to the issue of Christian warfare and the topic of health as it relates to the kingdom of God. <clears throat> For far too long, Christians have been plagued with an unbiblical, bifurcated view of the cosmos. Dewey Verd was absolutely correct. Many Christians are stuck in this two-story house, sort of Schaeferian language, this two-story house, with nature being the bottom floor where we do reason and we do science, while grace is that upper story that is only accessible by sacramentalism and non-rational faith. That's just what we have been given from the scholastics. Uh, all of us, and that's not to disparage scholasticism in its entirety, by the way, <laughs> but all of us participate in this created order to some degree or another, but when we step outside of our naive pre-theoretical thought and experience, and we jump into theorizing and thinking, about the cosmos, we realize that there's really only one possible way to do life, the Christian way. Now, I brought this philosophical angle today because it helps to explain two key things. One, health is an aspect of our lives that is, is very important because God gave us these bodies and there are laws that govern us. We're, we're swimming in God's world, whether we like it or not, and health is part of that. But two, what we've witnessed these past two years was nothing short of evolutionary thinking being given free reign, maximizing and absolutizing the health aspect of life, subsuming everything else. Now, in my book, I talk about the two main schools of thought related to health. The first is the naturopathic slash holistic model, which stems from Christian principles. And then the other is the allopathic model, which stems from evolutionary materialistic principles. The allopathics generally think of the body solely in terms of biological processes. The brain fires off neurons, the cerebral spinal fluid carries information up and down the spine, the blood carries oxygen and nutrients to the rest of the body, um, our liver produces bile, stores it with the gallbladder, and it aids in digestion, and on and on we go. These are the processes we, we know. These parts are considered evolutionary miracles because somehow evolution worked itself up and out of entropy and inexorable decline and, and improved. No one knows why, right? Now, allopaths generally view the body as entirely mechanistic, impersonal, and chemical. And this is why pharmaceuticals are given to patients, because certain chemical reactions in a beaker pass through an approval process validated by the FDA in order to be turned into a pill, which is then given to you, and some sort of chemical reaction takes place. But listen, here's the thing. No one is sick because they lack a petroleum-based drug that they cannot pronounce. No one is sick because of that. Allopaths don't understand sickness. They have no room for the spiritual, so they, they pound and inundate the physical body with medications that may suppress one symptom, but cause adverse drug reactions or an entirely different set of problems. Now, nat naturopathic medicine works with the assumption, and by the way, I should back up, that doesn't mean everything the allopathic world does is, is bad. Um, when you think of the advancements of, of scanning abilities and um, emergency ser services, uh, 
it's incredible what the allopathic world is able to do. And so we praise God for some of those advancements, heart surgeries and those types of things. Um, so that's not to disparage them entirely, but their worldview, like it or not, stems from those principles. But the naturopathic medicine works with the assumption that God has given us everything we need in this world and the plants and seeds that he gave us for food are both medicinal and fulfilling. So we assume in this school of thought that creation-based protocols work better because they work in conjunction with the whole person. It gets to the root of all things. So instead of depersonalizing someone, we see them as a whole person made in the image of God. Far from being mechanical, they are miraculous. Instead of being an evolved machine, man is uniquely material and spiritual. His body, soul, and spirit meet somewhere in the middle, no one knows exactly where, and he is, according to scripture, fearfully and wonderfully made. The reason we need to know these principles is because we are very much in a war. We are very much in a war today. The COVID hysteria proved that the state will do whatever it can to inject a substance in your body, firing you if necessary, without safety studies and data sheets, without any remorse in threatening your job and your livelihood. We are in a war of health, education, uh, uh, politics, sexual identity, and so on, because we are in a war of worldviews. Now, at its root, we are running up against pretended neutrality, which Van Til calls negation, meaning sinful men whose reason is not pure and untainted, contra the rationalists, assume the equal ultimacy and validity of everything under the sun, except for the creator of the sun. That's what sinful men are doing. This, I'm, I'm telling you who, what the enemy is thinking. And they think that their minds are undiluted, untainted, and pure, and that the equal ultimacy and validity of everything belongs in the mind and man, and in the heart in some cases when they desire the bloodshed of abortion. So assuming neutrality, assuming a disconnect from God, man negates the creator. And that's why we're in a war for our health. Idols have populated our land because of these things. Now, I wasn't against the lockdowns because I lost my job. I didn't. I wasn't against the lockdowns because other people lost their jobs, and they did. I wasn't against the lockdowns because I was scared either. I was against them because this is God's world, and the state has no right to govern the work of man in this way, to rob him of his ability to make and create wealth and provide for his family. The COVID war was foisted upon us by inept politicians and pagan scientists. That is simply the reality of the situation. When you do not start with Christian principles as it pertains to health, seeking Christ foremost, unlike Asa, you wind up with a totalitarian state governing what you eat, where you work, and what you put into your body. That is totalitarianism. Open war, Aragorn said to Theoden, is upon you whether you would risk it or not. So how should we fight this war? Well, we start with self-government. You should care about what you eat. You should consider and probably do a whole bunch of research on, on which sort of approach to food gives you maximum nutrition. You need those, uh, this way of eating. I think it was Einstein who said the future of, of being a doctor will be addressing food or, or the future of medicine is actually going to be uh, food. We treat diseases with food. So eat good foods. Do the, re do the research. In the book, I talk about the triad of health nutrify, detoxify, and energize. So you have to build good quality cells in your body. And those three things are all part of the process. Nutrify the body, detox the body, and energize the body. So good nutrition is, is and, and clean water is absolutely foundational. You also have to detox the body of fungi, parasites, heavy metals, and other pathogenic materials uh, and toxins, as it were. And you need to find a way to energize the body, getting good sleep, exercise, for example. All of us could do better in those areas. And again, that's all in the book. I'm not going to go into detail. Um, but we feed on Christ, and we need good nutrition. We feed on Christ, spiritual health, feed on good food, good nutrients for our physical health. We detox the body. We repent of our sin. We, we want to purge the soul of sin and unrighteousness, spiritually speaking. 
and then as far as the material body goes, we want to get rid of the harmful toxins that are in our body. Nutrify, detoxify, and then third, energize. Just like we need to depend on the Holy Spirit and God's word each day to energize and enliven, enliven us. So we need to have good, consistent patterns of rest and Sabbath for our physical body so that we can be ready and prepped for war. Now, the point is, take control of your health now. This, this battle, the philosophies, the pagan philosophies behind all of it, all of these things that I've just talked about, <clears throat> brings us to, to the theological principle of self-government. You need to be able to take control of your health now, not later. Do it now, not later. Open war. <laughs> Open war is upon you with a totalitarian state wanting to control this area of life, whether you like it or not. And also remember that having bad health through bad choices is no one's fault but your own. Take that responsibility. Godly dominion requires responsibility. You can be healthy, but you have to put in the work. And it is hard. But blame shifting and all those things aren't going to work. If, if we're going to serve Christ and his kingdom in this area, then we need a holistic gospel for a holistic person for a holistic church. Churches simply must promote and teach self-government in this area. When you're sick, you're out of the fight. And most Christians don't care because they don't even realize they're in a fight, let alone that they should be fighting. Well, we're out of time, and uh, there's so much that could be said on this topic. Get off the prescription drugs. Walk barefoot in the grass. Get tons of sunlight. Don't put any, don't put any of that cream on your, your skin. You don't need it. It causes cancer anyway, but... Get plenty of sunlight and be judicious about it and shrewd about it. Bounce on a mini trampoline. Get your lymphatic system going. Eat way more fruits and vegetables than you're already doing. Get servings upon servings every day. Learn about chlorine dioxide, uh, clo2.tv. Uh, learn about TRS to detox the body of heavy metals. Uh, you can reach out to me if you have any questions on that. But developing a healthy physical life can only stem from a healthy spiritual life. So stay in the word, stay in prayer, and for goodness sake, sing to the glory of God. Singing glorifies God, and you know what else it does? It stimulates your vagus nerve. <laughs> Did you know that? So grow a garden, plant some flowers, head to the beach, go for a walk, don't drink so much alcohol. Find ways to encourage your spouse, encourage your friends, and encourage your church. In general, live life with lots of joy, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we have this comprehensive gospel to deal with the comprehensive issues that we face today. And uh, I ask and pray today that you would help um, my brothers and sisters in uh, Indiana with Cruciform Bible Institute. And uh, we pray for them and pray that you would uh, increase their tribe as well. Lord, we want to serve you and your kingdom. So help us to be healthy. Help us to have self-government in this area. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, that's it for us. Uh, grace and peace, friends. It's good to be with you. And please feel free to reach out if you have any questions.